Lord, the light of your love is shining in the midst of the darkness shining. Jesus, light of the world, shine upon us. Set us free by the truth you now bring us. Shine on me. Shine on me. Shine, Jesus, shine. Good morning. Thanks for joining me. I'm Dave Grant, and we're going to continue our study of Acts today. So if you'd like to get your Bible out, you can follow along with me. I'm going to begin in Acts chapter 8 today, and we're going to read just a few verses as we set the stage for the church growing under the providence of God. And just to review, last week we looked at three or two of the three P's dealing with the execution of Stephen. Stephen was a preacher of the gospel, and he was stoned to death for his belief in Jesus. There was a purpose for Stephen's story, and that is a purpose in his death. There is evidence of his participation in sharing the gospel. So we got purpose, participation, and today we just want to take a few minutes and look at the providence of God. Um, I'm sure that from time to time you've wondered, why does God allow bad things to happen to innocent people or to good people? Well, the word providence means divine guidance and care. That's what the word means. So, does bad things happen to good people, does that sound like guidance and care? Well, not on our uh, viewpoint, our perspective. We want things to, we want to be comfortable, we want to have fun, we want everything to be good. And Stephen's execution is the providence of God, but it's not God who executed Stephen, it was evil but God's guidance and care were involved because through his death, his stoning by evil people, Stephen got to go home to heaven. Jesus was there for him. Also, from Acts 8, 1 through 3, we see that others suffered like Stephen. And what happened was that the church grew what does it mean the church grew? Well, if you have 5,000 people in the church who are saved, who don't have to worry about death because they're going to live forever in heaven, those 5,000 people are all in one city. How are we going to get that message out of that city into the whole world? Well, God's providence is His care, His guidance and care He's going to actually allow persecution, which will spread the message. It's kind of like uh, you got a little fire going and you smack it, and sometimes it will actually spread because little embers and coals will go out into some dry grass, and pretty soon you got a nice big fire. Well, similar, the spreading of the gospel was all in Jerusalem, but Saul's execution of Stephen and then the jailing of many others who are Christians actually allowed people to escape Jerusalem and they took the gospel message with them. They took the love of Jesus everywhere they went and people were saved. So the church grew in number. Let's read Acts 8. This is right after Stephen has died in Acts chapter 7. Stephen has been stoned to death. He's now dead. 
and Saul approved of his execution. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. But Saul was ravaging the church, and entering house to house, he dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. So the church is going... You might say, that's not divine guidance and care. Yes, it is. It really is. Once we have been saved and our sins have been forgiven, it really doesn't matter how long we live here. And we look for opportunities while we're here to tell as many about that salvation as possible. But our eternal life can begin at any time. Um, that's why we don't need to fear death. Uh, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and I, I read it at the funerals of uh, Christians, believers who are saved often, because it says, we do not have to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. But we believe Jesus died, was buried and rose again, and he will come back to take us to be with him. So we... We will grieve when someone dies because we're going to miss them. We're going to miss the relationship. But we don't have to grieve down in the depths of our soul because we know that we will be with them forever in heaven. So that concludes the providence of God. Why do bad things happen to good people? Because there's evil in the world. So many times it's because, well, People think, well, God's doing it. No, God isn't doing it. God has set things in motion. We have chosen evil. Sin is now in the world, and that evil is going to cause a lot of grief. But God gave us a pathway out through the cross of Jesus. So we don't have to grieve like the rest of men. So I wrote down four things that we can take from the story of Stephen's execution. Things that we can hold on to. We need to be consistent in truth and conviction. Consistent means we're always going to be truthful and we're always going to do what is right. Number two, Christians never suffer or die without purpose. There is purpose in our death and that purpose is to put away the old and to rise to live the new. Number three, we must be prepared because our plan may not always be his plan. It's possible Stephen could have toned down the rhetoric in his speech and not have been stoned to death, just thrown in prison. Or if he kind of fudged it a little bit and didn't tell the whole truth, maybe they might just let him go. And then he would live another day to share the gospel message. The gospel message means nothing if you've lied to get there. If you've deceived to get there. So we have to be consistent in truth. We have to realize that God's plan for us is to share his message. We can only share his message if we're truthful. I wanted to share one last thing with you about Stephen. In the Greek, his name was Stephanos. And that word had meaning, as most of the Greek words did. It means crown or victor's wreath. That was, so that word was the crown or victor's wreath. So in a marathon, whoever won that marathon would be crowned with the victor's wreath. And I'm sure you've seen pictures of that. Well, this particular Stephanos is a round headdress made of olive branches given to the victors of the ancient Olympic Games. When Stephen's parents named him, they probably had no clue of what his name would come to mean. But he was, for every intents and purposes, 
the real meaning of be faithful even to the point of death and I will give you the crown of life. Stephen and his name Stephanos was the crown of life. He received his eternal glory because he was faithful even to the point of death. We can have that same hope by following and being truthful to the word. Stephen was a guy just like us, but he chose to be committed to truth and he chose to be committed to sharing God's message. And Stephen died for it. It's possible that even today Christians will die for what they believe. Now we're going to be moving on a little bit and this is also in Acts, but it's another picture of, in God's photo album, of how we become part of this new life. It's a purpose in baptism. There was a purpose in death through Stephen, but there's a purpose in baptism. And if you think about it, uh, we have a natural inclination, if we're dirty, to, to wipe it off. We don't want to be dirty, and there might be some exceptions to that rule. Uh, I've seen the grandkids come in from the yard sometimes, and they've been playing on the mud hill, and they just seem to really enjoy being dirty. But uh, there was one day recently where they were playing on this big hill of uh, topsoil that had been pulled up into a hill because we put in a new road for uh, my daughter's home that's going to be built on our property. So this huge hill of dirt, the kids love playing on it, and, and they dig holes, and then they build castles. And we had some older grandkids over that day. And they saw I was using a hose to tend the fire to make sure it didn't spread. And so they tapped into that hose where I have a little Y connector, and they put the hose on top of the mud hill. And within minutes, I'm hearing this squealing and this screaming of, I think there was seven of them there. Maybe, no, no, there was 10 grandkids that day. 10 grandkids sliding down that hill in the mud and getting as dirty as you can possibly get. Now, that is not in my estimation, the way most of us feel. I did not want to slide down that mud hill. But they did want to get rid of it afterwards. So they do have some common sense, don't they? So we put them in a plastic swimming pool and we hosed them all down and then they had to take a shower and then we had to wash their clothes. It was a lot of work, but we had the desire to be clean. God knows about that desire to be clean. And he has allowed for purification. All through the Old Testament, he had uh, a ritual purification so that they could see that coming to God, they needed to be clean. And so they would offer sacrifices. They would uh, cleanse their clothes. They would wash their bodies. They would actually come to God cleansed. All through the Old Testament. In the New Testament, the dirt that is on all of us is sin. And God cannot have sin in his presence, so we need to be cleansed to be in fellowship with God. And our sins need to be washed away. So there is purpose in baptism so that we can come before God clean, clear conscience, ready to do his work. And so I have a couple examples for you from the Bible. Some of them are from Acts, but we're going to start in the Old Testament. Do you remember Noah? Noah was the one with the flood, okay, and the big boat. He's getting a lot more attention lately because of the ark encounter. Um, I believe it's in Tennessee or Kentucky. I can't remember exactly where, but... Um, the Ark Encounter is supposedly a life-size replica of the Ark in Genesis chapters 6, 7, and 8. So what I want to do is start there because uh, I want to give you some real information, truthful information from the Bible about the flood and about the Ark. 
So if you want to turn with me to Genesis chapter 7, it's all the way in the front of your Bible. Genesis chapter 7. This is in the early days, way back in the beginning. There's 7. Now, chapter 6 will give you a story about uh, why God decided to have Noah build an ark. It was because of the evil that had become rampant in the world. And so God said, I want to destroy everything I've created and start over again. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. In other words, God saw goodness in Noah and his family. So he decided to start over again in Noah's family. Everyone else is killing each other. Every thought of their heart is evil. And so God gives him instructions how to build the ark. But I want to read verse 1 of chapter 7. And it says, Then the Lord said to Noah, Go into the ark, you and all your household, for I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. And then drop down to verses 4 and 5. For in seven days, God said, I will send rain on the earth forty days and forty nights, and every living, every living thing that I have made I will blot out from the face of the ground. And Noah did all that the Lord commanded him. So that's the setting for our story. God is actually preparing to cleanse the creation. He's going to wipe away all the filth, all the evil, and he's going to start over. At Genesis 6, 7, and 8. Now, I want to read verses 11 and 12. Same chapter. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, on that day all the fountains of the great deep burst forth, and the windows of the heavens were opened and rain fell upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights so water in the ground burst forth water in the sky came down and the flood covered the earth there is enough water under the ground and above the ground to flood the earth and God allowed that to be but he had Noah and his family in the ark so they would be saved. Now drop down to verse 17. The flood continued 40 days on the earth. The waters increased and bore up the ark, and it rose high above the earth. The waters prevailed and increased greatly on the earth, and the ark floated on the face of the waters. And the waters prevailed so mightily on the earth that all the high mountains under the whole heaven were covered. The waters prevailed above its mountains, covering them 15 cubits deep, which is about 22, 23 feet. So the highest mountain, the water was above the mountain that much. And all flesh died that moved on the earth. Birds livestock, beasts, all swarming creatures that swarm on the earth, and all mankind. Everything on the dry land, in whose nostrils was the breath of life, died. He blotted out every living thing that was on the face of the ground, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens. They were blotted out from the earth. Only Noah was left and those who were with him in the ark. And the waters prevailed on the earth for 150 days. So the flood was extensive. And it cut out all life that had breath in its nostrils. If the fish were in the sea, they were not destroyed. But all the birds, all the creeping things, all the beasts, all the cattle, everything else was destroyed. And all mankind. This was a judgment of God. He could have completely erased everything and had Noah die in the flood too. But Noah was righteous before the Lord. Noah was one like Stephen who spoke the truth. 
and was committed to following God's way. So because of that, God started with him and everything else died. Now I want to read 1 Peter 3, 18 through 22. So there was a cleansing in Genesis 7, wasn't there? A cleansing of the earth of all the evil that had been done and all the evil that was in the hearts of men and women. If you want to find 1 Peter quickly, go to the back of your Bible and go to Hebrews. And Hebrews is a little bit bigger than the others. Hebrews, James, 1 and 2 Peter. And 1 Peter chapter 3, I'm going to read verses 18 through 22. And I want you to be prepared. This is talking about the flood, but it's also then fast forwarding to the cleansing that God is preparing for us. 18. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the cross, the righteous, that would be Jesus, for the unrighteous, that's me, that he might bring us to God, or bring, a lot of times I'll make the scriptures personal. For Christ also suffered once for sins, Jesus, the righteous for Dave, the unrighteous, that he might bring me to God. Being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey, when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water, so he's talking about the, the safely through water is being saved from the, the cleansing that God did to the earth. The judgment against all the evil. He saved Noah and his family. Baptism, verse 21, which corresponds to this, now saves you. Not the, as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven, is at, is at the right hand of God, with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. Again, consistent with everything else we've read, the cleansing in the days of Noah was judgment against evil, but Noah was saved through that. Baptism... The water baptism of the New Testament, which you read about all through the book of Acts, baptism corresponds to that and saves us also. So we, like Noah, have been saved, and it's through the water of baptism. So when I'm baptized into Christ, immersed into Christ for the forgiveness of my sins, when I rise up, I get to start again, brand new. So baptism has purpose. It's not just a symbol for somebody, but rather it's the answer of my conscience saying, I want to be yours, God. Save me through this water. Someone uh, casually reading through this letter written by Paul, or by Peter, 1 Peter, would most likely conclude that baptism and salvation are connected. You could not read that and not see that they're connected. And yet we have people every day saying baptism is not connected to salvation. Read that over and over a few times. It, there's no other way to read it. Baptisms, which corresponds, saves you also. And you and I both know that not everyone teaches as straightforward as the Bible does. Why not just take the picture or the image that God has given us of being buried in baptism, rising up out of the waters of baptism to live a new life? Why not keep it that simple? It's through the waters of baptism. It's not, we're not baptized in water so that we can wash the filth off. That's not going to have any impact on sin. But our obedience to God's desire that we be baptized washes our sins away because of the cross of Christ. Now, there's a lot more to cover. 
about baptism. And there's another picture in the, uh, it's in the New Testament about the Old Testament. And we're going to be doing that next week. We're going to continue looking at, well, why water? And why is it connected to salvation? Um, we're going to talk about Moses and how baptism is even connected to Moses in the Old Testament. And what form of baptism is necessary to be pleasing to God? Before I go, though, I do want to spend just a little bit of time, um, only a minute or so, about in the early or the late winter of 2020, we're going to have a special two weeks of one-hour programs. Jim and I are going to do them together. And I actually wrote a little article to our supporters, our financial supporters of the TV ministry, who are members of the Churches of Christ all across the country. And I told them, this is what I've got in mind. I want to influence the election in 2020 through Jesus' words in the Bible. I want to have an impact. And it won't be like a, a Russian influence or collusion. It won't be phony dossiers. It will be, what would Jesus do if he was in this country right now and making a decision on who to vote for. Is Jesus going to be caught up in the hate? Or is he going to be looking above that and trying to lead people to a better place? So I just wanted to give you a preview of coming attractions. Two one-hour special programs on what we can do as Christians to change the election. I. I'm excited about it, and uh, it's not going to be political. It's going to be biblical. I think we should let the Bible speak to our next election. Before I go, we have a uh, seven-lesson Bible course that you can take in the privacy of your home. This will help you get started in Bible study if you're brand new to it. Or if you have not read it on a regular basis and you're not really sure what you should be looking at, this is a guide that will take you through the Bible to tell you what God would expect from someone who loves him. If you don't have a Bible to study with, I offer free of charge a hardcover new inner, uh, not new inner, it's an English standard version. And that's the same version I read on the program. These Bibles are made available to us by the supporters I was just talking about. And we can offer it free of charge. You can write to me at the Church of Christ in Escanaba, P.O. Box 751. The zip is 49829. Or you can go on our webpage, letthebiblespeak.net. All of these things are available there as well. And we do encourage you to get involved in Bible study on a regular basis. We only can let the Bible speak as the authority in our lives. I want to thank you for being with me. I'll see you next week. God bless.